good morning or good afternoon or good evening, whatever time it is when you are watching this. I want to thank you for taking the time to get involved about this election. And also thank you to the chamber for hosting this recording session. Uh, even though we may not be in person with everybody that's watching this, um, it's a great opportunity to talk about a common goal that we have of, for our community, some challenges that we are facing, and the opportunity that we have in this election to continue to build a vibrant and sustainable future for our community of Kerrville for generations to come. My name is Roman Garcia. I am a Christian conservative and I am running to serve as your mayor of our wonderful and beloved community here in Kerrville. I've had the opportunity of serving the citizens of Kerrville on the city council for over three years now, going on my third year. I was re-elected or elected in May of 2021 and re-elected in May 2023. As a dedicated representative of the citizens for almost three years, I've had the privilege of serving our community and working along many of you for the betterment of our community and advancing the best interest for Kerrville to make sure that we have the best place to live, work, play, and worship. As a fourth generation Kerrvillian and public servant, I have a unique understanding of the needs, potential, and the history of our community to continue moving forward. During my tenure, I have worked during, with almost every aspect of our community government and have collaborated with many stakeholders in our community. Along with serving on the council, I'm actively involved in a number of local and national civic and nonprofit organizations. Some include Curva Little League, uh, Run Gen Z, which is a national organization where I serve as a mentor for prospective leaders running for municipal, state, and national government offices. I'm also the co-founder and president of the Young Americans Action Coalition, a new entity here in Kerr County that is working to educate, encourage, and empower the younger generation to get involved in the community. I'm sure there's a lot that we're going to cover here in this forum, but I will leave you with this. While serving Kerrville as mayor, it will be my aim to make decisions that will enhance today while being mindful of our history and future generations. I look forward to elaborating on some of our community priorities and how we can work together in my responses to the questions during this forum. Thank you. First off, I want to thank the Kerrville Area Chamber of Commerce for hosting all of the candidates. It's important that the candidates get a chance to talk with voters, and I appreciate it. I'm running for mayor. I was born here in Kerrville. I graduated from Tyvee. I went to the University of Texas at Austin, where I met my college sweetheart. We're still married. I graduated from uh, UT in 1982. Uh, I, we raised our kids here. Lots of soccer, lots of track meets. Uh, Carolyn and I uh, have, their, our children are now adults, and so we have an empty nest. Uh, I was mayor before. I was mayor from 1992 to 1994, and I never thought I'd be running for office again, but I'm happy to do so. Uh, two reasons. First, because of a sense of duty. If you're asked to serve, you should. And second, being mayor is a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to doing it again. Hello, my name is Barbara Duell Ferguson. I'm running for Place 4 City Council here in Kerrville. Um, I've been a resident of Kerrville for 18 years. Um, really love Kerrville, love Texas for all the reasons that brought many of you here and keep you here in Kerrville. I, my background is in residential home site development. My late husband and I had a development of over 300 homes uh, with a possible total total build out somewhere between 450, 500 homes. We had our own water and sewer plant that we owned and operated. I had my um, wastewater license. So I've had a lot of experience with infrastructure, dealing with governmental agencies, um, water, and um, also land planning, development, and infrastructure. When we moved to Kerrville, a lot of the reason was because we just found it was such an appealing place. We had traveled around a lot and trying to figure out where we would like to spend retirement and Kerrville won out over all the others. And um, a lot of that was due to the people. It really was the friendliest place we had visited. 
So when we came here, I became very concerned that we would see the same thing happen in Texas that we had watched happen in Colorado. And I wanted to help preserve the things that made Kerrville the town that it is today. So I got involved locally. First off, by meeting with city council, going to a lot of the meetings, going to headwaters, groundwaters meeting, um, county commissioner meetings. And I began to see information that told me Curva really needed to look closely at their water situation and growth. And um, as I began sharing that and asking questions and things, I saw that there really was a need for more transparency when it came to that situation. So that really has, is what spurred me on to run for city council because over my years of involvement, I didn't see a move in that direction to really address those issues. So my involvement here locally has been more limited. I lost my husband several years ago and after he died, um, I then met Bill Ferguson and Bill and I have been married for two years. Bill's a retired Border Patrol agent, and um, we have uh, four children and four grandchildren between the two of us spread all across Texas. So I look forward to answering questions. Hi, my name is Brenda Hughes, and I am running for my third term as your place for city council representative. My husband was born and raised here and I got here as quick as I could. We've been here now together for uh, 34 years and we uh, have been privileged to raise four children here in Kerrville and um, our proud grandparents to 15 grandchildren who all call Kerr County their home. Um, along with our business that we've run here in Kerrville for 31 years. Uh, my focus has been on safety and security. And um, I consider my community family and I feel as though we are walking the path through life together. And so I feel as though I need to do my part to ensure that we're all safe uh, and that our children are safe and that we have the, have the best community for our residents to live in. Hi, I'm Brent Bates. I'm running for place three here in Kerrville, Texas for the city council. I've been here 33 years. Uh, I've done a whole lot of different things. Uh, a lot of you know me, but unfortunately, there's probably a lot of you that don't. Uh, I did a moderation a while back with the, at the library and came to the realization that there was very few people that had been here more than 30 years. Most people had been here five or 10 years. A Couple of things that you might know me from is, is I uh, built the original Little League fields out there across from the uh, Junior Ag Barn back in about 94 or so. I uh, started the river trail. I built the first thousand feet of it five years before the city started building theirs. I've started two charter schools uh, here in town, uh, and I've been very active in soccer and all sorts of things. I'm married, been married to my wife for 36 years, I have a 34-year-old and a 30-year-old daughter, and I have a six-month-old granddaughter, which is kind of the apple of my eye presently. Um, I have been a financial advisor predominantly here in town, although later in my career, I got involved with real estate development. And so many of y'all would know me from various projects that I've built. For instance, uh, River Guide Village, which is the office park across from the Catholic Church there on the river, uh, the condos next to Dietert, um, the Town Creek Village, which is next to Gibson's, um, and a whole host of all other kinds of things. I've been very, very active in the community. I've sat on many boards for 20 years on the Hill Country Youth Ranch Board. And in fact, while I was on that board, I assisted them and was kind of the catalyst and the, and, the, and the big push behind them opening up two charter schools, which has turned out to be very successful for them as an organization. Many times on the boards, and one of the things that I bring that a lot of people other don't bring is, is I'm pretty thick skinned. Um, you generally don't go out and create anything unique or anything special 
by listening to those that uh, want to keep everything the same that it is. And so, uh, interestingly enough, you'll see on my website, I've got articles where people wanted to pull my permits and how dare we start a river trail and what do we think we're doing? And I can remember times where we had an entire meeting where there was only like five people that were uh, supporting me and 90 people that were against me. Um, and so because of that, I think I can give a certain level of vision that probably is not on the board presently. And I can also give the perspective of someone that's been here a long time. And, and having been here a long time, you get to understand how things run and how things might run in a way that we don't really want to continue. And so I would bring that uh, to the city council as well. I look forward to your vote and, and vote for me for place three. So some of that um, was in my introduction. Um, I've been involved um, a lot throughout the community since um, a young age. Actually, kind of what inspired me to get involved in city government started with community service. Um, I was involved with a number of nonprofits, first just, and local groups, first just volunteering, um, like the food pantry at St. Vincent de Paul. Um, I was actually on the board of the Kerrville Little League whenever I was in high school. Um, uh, serving as the umpire in chief and uh, I've worked with Habitat for Humanity and a lot of other uh, organizations in our community and so since then you know I started really getting a sense for what the community really um, wants and needs in terms of just volunteerism and then I started getting involved a lot more in, in the city government side um, attending city council meetings before I could even drive uh, whenever I was in government and so a lot I put a lot of that together and took my involvement and aspiration and community involvement and my love for government and the law, which I'm currently studying right now, and put that together and made it public service. Um, my involvement right now um, involves, you know, Kerrville Little League. I serve as a secretary of the board. Um, I was spontaneously elected in October. Was in a position I was seeking, but I always attended their membership meetings um, and was asked to serve in that capacity. I was also recently appointed to serve as the umpire in chief of that. And then of course, like I said, one of the big things that we're looking at doing is really getting our youth involved way more in our community. And I think that's needed because the decisions that individuals make, whether it's in government or not, really we're gonna reap the benefits, we're gonna suffer the consequences. And so doing that through our community um, and those local government um, and entities has been, I think, a very big uh, improvement in our community, and I look forward to continue doing that as mayor as well. Well, I was uh, involved since 1990 or so. I was actually the chair of the board of the Kerrville Area Chamber of Commerce, and the funny thing is, I didn't know this room was up here. Uh, I've been involved in a lot of other nonprofits. I was on the board of the Dole Community Center, the Symphony of the Hills, uh, the Kerrville Folk Festival. Uh, I was church a church council chair at Trinity Baptist. I, I, I have a lot of experience working with nonprofit boards. And the reason I do that, again, is because I like serving my community. I have been involved here locally um, with the um, city council, Headwaters Groundwater. I've served on the public safety committee for the public uh, safety facility. I also have been involved with uh, my local church and the, um, done some volunteer work with Meals on Wheels. I served as a substitute driver for a while for them, which I really enjoyed. And that, that took me way back to when I was a Meals on Wheels driver when my children were little. So I've done that a few times. Um, I also, in, uh, in, in the past, worked in uh, Habitat for Humanity and volunteered for Junior Achievement. Uh, they do economic education programs in the schools for children. So that's some of those involvements. Um, in addition, it was community service involvement and public service. Let's see. So anyway, I think, I think that'll wrap up that part of the question. Okay, well, um, I am proud to be the founding member and vice president of the board for Kerrville Pets Alive. Uh, that's one of the nonprofits that I'm active in. Um, I also have been a Hill Country CASA 
for 12 years and I sit on their board as their vice president. Um, I spent about six years uh, both as a member and the chair of the Food Service Advisory Board um, for the city of Kerrville and I am the secretary for the um, Ker Kerrville Citizens Police Academy Alumni Association. So, and in my spare time, I am the event organizer for the Hill Country Swap Meet Market Days event. Yes, I've been involved in a number of nonprofits. Uh, like I said in my opening statement, probably the longest held position I had was with the Hill Country Youth Ranch for about 20 years. And for those that don't know, the Hill Country Youth Ranch uh, takes in uh, basically wards of the state of the state of Texas. Unfortunately, many of them have been sexually and physically abused. I did a lot of work in that organization, uh, helped them start a couple charter schools that's really helped them, and uh, brought a lot of other things to bear. In fact, I remember going and talking in Austin with the head of CPS explaining to them how that they had a system that would rotate uh, people as far as their classification and in trying to save money they were actually hurting the organizations and the kids because many of the kids fell behind in classification which caused them to kind of have to start all over again. I've done all the little league, I've done the club volleyball, I've done baseball. In fact I started girls uh, softball here in town, I built the little league fields here in town. We had the, the nine-year-old all-star state champs the year that I was president, and I didn't even have a, I don't even have a boy. Uh, my daughter at the time was about a year and a half or two years old. So I've done all the, the rubber chicken circuits and, and all the fajita dinners and, and so on and so forth. Um, and that's part of what I've really loved about living here, and that's part of why I moved here, because I really do enjoy getting to know other people's kids and enjoying watching other people go through life and having their uh, victories and, and, of course, their challenges as well. And so uh, my community service, I think, is pretty well unparalleled because I just barely scratched the surface of all that I've done over the last 35 years. Yeah, so first, everything I think we can all believe and agree that starts with the budget. Um, that comes as an individual, a family, a business, and especially a municipal corporation like the city, everything derives its priorities from the budget. And as city council, we have an important responsibility every fiscal year to set the budget and determine what those priorities are gonna be for every year moving forward. I'm talking with citizens throughout our community, the, I would say three most important issues are growth, water, and infrastructure development. Um, growth is inevitable, it's gonna happen, but how we take on that growth um, is very important to our community and making sure we do it responsibly. With the growth comes added people to our community, and that brings a strain on our infrastructure, both water, sewer, utilities, and so the city of Kerrville needs to make sure that we are investing your taxpayer dollars very responsibly to make sure that everything that we're doing is for the betterment of the community, especially the citizens who are here first. Another concern that derives off of the growth is that individuals believe that we are focusing a lot on improvements for tourists to come to our community rather than making sure that we're taking care of the citizens who are here first. And so I believe that using your taxpayer dollars is a very, is a very important responsibility that your mayor and city council has. Whether it's property tax revenue, sales tax, or other bonds, we need to make sure to use those for the benefit of the citizens who are here first. So putting all that together, I think we can use those to look at what other water infrastructure and supply mechanisms we have for the long-term sustainability of our community, and also making sure that we're investing in our infrastructure. I don't know if it's gonna be a, a question moving forward, but an example is almost every year we're required to uh, budget about $4 million when we're only doing about $2 million. So making sure we're taking care of that responsibly is important. I think the top three issues facing the city are number one, water. Funny thing, that was the top issue in 1992 uh, when I was mayor. And we worked on that by working with UGRA to establish some aquifer storage recovery wells, which are still in use. The second big issue is, in my opinion, uh, reviewing the comprehensive plan, also known as the Kerrville 2050 plan. It's time to give it another look because it's, 
it's being used as a blueprint for the future of our community. And last, growth. How can we have sustainable growth? We don't want to outstrip our resources, but we also know people are coming. It's going to grow. Kerrville is going to grow. And we want to make sure that we have sustainable growth. Well, I think one of the most pressing problems is um, our water supply and growth. And those two really go hand in hand. Um, this is going to be a tricky one because water is a natural resource. We can't make more of it. We might be able to find more of it, but we can't make it. And um, my concern right now is that there are only a couple of ways we can address this issue. One is either increase our storage, increase our, um, or decrease our demand, um, and reduce our growth, which affects the demand. Um, we also need to look at conservation. And those all done together can help the situation. We also need to do work on our infrastructure. Uh, currently, we have dead end lines that require extensive flushing. And if the dead end lines were eliminated, that would help with our water quality, as well as reduce the amount of water that has to be flushed out. Um, somewhere, the city manager gave the figure of 26 million gallons a year are flushed out onto the ground, and that's treated water, water we've already paid to clean up, and it gets flushed out on the ground. So that goes to uh, conservation and also water safety if we fix that issue. So those are a couple of the, the ways we can address it directly to water. But growth is the other one. We have to be realistic about how much growth we can sustain. And ignoring the problem and pushing forward without taking into consideration the real facts is to our peril. Um, I'm not against growth, but we have to have the water to sustain it. Okay, well, first and foremost, safety and security is the priority, priority for me. And um, we were fortunate enough to get some ARPA funds and we were able to get um, sophisticated body cams for our officers. We were able to get canine, a canine unit. We were able to get tasers. And um, I'm very proud of the fact that we are able to um, through the help of our voters, provide a state-of-the-art KPD complex for our officers that should be finished by 20, summer of 2025. Um, that facility uh, passed through a bond election, and um, as far as other priorities and how we would pay for that, obviously water infrastructure is huge, and we have about a hundred and twelve million dollar water infrastructure problem and the way that we will deal with that is kind of the same way you eat an elephant one bite at a time we'll take that water infrastructure in segments and we'll borrow against each segment until we get the project complete and that's what cities do because those kinds of expenses are are huge and you you cannot save money in order to pay for that kind of stuff. You've got to borrow. Well, I ran for mayor in 2022 and they asked me that question and I said it was inflation and water. And interestingly enough, inflation hadn't really reared its head by May in 2022 and a number of people chuckled. And I'm going to tell you, it's still inflation and it's still water and it's a few things besides that. The concern we have now is, is, and I managed money back in the early 80s, we have not done anything as a nation to thwart inflation. And in fact, we've done everything possible to extend it. And so now we run the risk of going from inflation to stagflation. And unfortunately here in Kerrville, we haven't done the things that you can do in a local community to try and stem that. And that is, is to pull in your belt, uh, retrench a little bit, get out of some things that probably aren't your core uh, functions for society and make sure that you try and keep your expenses as low as possible. You know, in the last two years we've gone up by 
uh, 20 percent in our property taxes. We're about 65 million more in debt. And so it, it is going to be more critical than ever for us to be able to really go in and, and work hard on the budget and make sure that we get value for every dollar that we spend and also to make sure that we're spending the dollar for the citizens that are giving us the dollar. I, I was a certified financial planner for decades. I'm all about planning, but sometimes you can set a plan and that plan is so far out in the future that if you're spending dollars today for something you're expecting 20 or 30 years from now, uh, you can get yourself a little bit off course. And, and I'm a little bit concerned that that's kind of what we have done here in town is, is we've gotten a little bit too lax in uh, OPM, other people's money, which is mainly the taxpayers. A lot of the young people that work multiple jobs are really struggling and need us to tighten our belt. I think the center of our, or the core of our community, really a lot of people believe is the downtown. And I agree with that. Uh, but we have a lot of businesses that are not just located downtown. So how we can revitalize that and make sure that we um, support an atmosphere that is welcoming for local businesses is very important. A lot of the uh, interesting things that you'll see right now going on and even previously, there are incentives being given to outside businesses and developers to come into our community for potential individuals to come and live in our community. But what are we doing for those who are already here, the mom and pop shops who are opening up and the businesses who are trying to sustain uh, their entity here in the downtown area? Some things that I think that we can do is to make sure that we incentivize local businesses by creating less stringent and burdensome regulations. That's not only on the developer side, that's even residentials. That's very important, um, government has a uh, big responsibility in that way. Second, we have a Main Street Advisory Board under the City Council that I think we can utilize a lot more. Working with our citizens and other community stakeholders is important to make sure that we're keeping what's important to the citizens at the core of everything that our local government does. And our Main Street Advisory Board, which City Council makes appointments to regularly, I think can be utilized a lot more to figure out what can we do not only for the downtown area, but for local businesses will, um, throughout our community. A lot of those initiatives I've seen um, and talked to individuals, those don't always get taken up by the city council. And I think it's important that as mayor, you work very closely with the chair and members of, that, of those several boards. And also, if, if needed, create some type of community stakeholder um, group to work towards making sure that we find innovative solutions to all these issues facing our community because businesses and jobs are the structure and core part of any living community. Well, you know, this council and previous councils have been working very closely with the Kerr Economic Development Corporation. In fact, I serve on the EIC, Economic Improvement Corporation. Uh, most recently, the most recent success is Megacrete, which will be a concrete uh, products company. They're not making concrete, they're using concrete to make products. And there'll be about 40, well, good paying jobs there, but uh, the real play is sales tax. Their headquarters will be here. So every unit they sell, the sales tax will come to Kerrville. And we've been working very hard to diversify uh, the income streams for the city, not relying only on property tax, but trying to build other tax revenues. And it's been successful. Property tax revenues will be about $12 million this year. And sales tax, we've got $11 million this year. So we rely less and less on property taxes to meet Kerrville's needs and more and more on sales taxes. There is one, th one thing that I really um, am intrigued about as far as future job growth in Kerrville. And I would love to see a top-notch um, training school for um, all kinds of um, skills in the trades, such as welding, HVAC, um, auto repair, um, those types of trades that plumbing, electro, electrical, because we have a, a very heavy retirement base in our community. And retirees, I hear constantly, are trying to find people to do, provide those kinds of services. There seems to be a shortage. You wait weeks in order to get an irrigation guy or an HVAC guy to be able to come in and do work at your home. So 
these jobs also become very well paying jobs with time. Um, as a young person would go into a trade school, get their, get their um, license in these areas, they can have a good job working for someone and even a better one if they go forward and form their own business. I think we can support that kind of um, growth and I would really like to see us work hard on that. Well, the strategies are pretty simple. You have to have the housing. So we're actively working on attainable housing for Kerrville. It's part of the 2050 plan because without housing, you cannot keep your critical workers. And by critical workers, I mean law enforcement. I mean first responders, teachers, uh, those kinds of healthcare workers. Um, we need attainable housing for that segment of our population in order to stimulate job growth. Well, interestingly enough, my wife, uh, many, many years ago, before we moved here, so that's, you know, 30, 33, 34 years ago, worked for the downtown Raleigh Development Corporation in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I observed at that time through the work that they were doing, and this was early on in a lot of these downtown developments and a lot of these other kind of organizations, that, that many times they're almost as much kind of a PR and, and, a, and a presentation piece as they really have the ability to strike deals and, and bring people to town. I always kind of like believe with uh, what Daryl Royal said. Daryl Royal said, you dance with the one that brung you. And what brought us all to Kerrville, I came here for the weather, I came here for the climate, I came here for the scenery, I came here for the hunting, I came here for the fishing, I came here for the small town, I came here for the community aspect of it, I came here for the ability to know my neighbors, I came here for safety and security and, and not having to be in the madhouse of the world. I grew up in North Dallas, I could have stayed in North Dallas. I didn't want anything to do with North Dallas, I moved here. I think what we really need to do is make sure that we're enhancing those things that brought everybody here. And yes, I'm a developer, I develop stuff, I'm certainly interested in growth, but I'll tell you, when I, when I built my office park across from the Catholic Church playground, I bought the land in 2002, and I still have one site that I haven't developed. And so literally, you have to look at things on a much longer term basis, and we're not going to be able, unfortunately, to shift the tax base completely to business. We've always been a bedroom community. We need to be a very economically viable bedroom community with low taxes and with all the things that all of us moved here for. And unfortunately, I think some people are kind of losing sight of that perspective. So the 2050 plan, for those of you not aware, was a plan developed a few years, several years ago, I would say now. And I actually served on one of the subcommittees for that plan, working on the community placemaking um, subcommittee. And our job was to make sure that we took into account the overall communities and neighborhoods within our city to, make sure, to ensure the long-term stability and the kind of growth that we're going to be expecting. Uh, and like I said before, that's a big topic in our community right now. So I think every single year we need to be looking at are we continuing to prioritize what's in the 2050 plan there are that's a very comprehensive plan as it's put and there are a lot of action items that i believe the city council can work towards with other community stakeholders to make sure that we accomplish in that um, and serving on the city council at, for a few years now we've taken up a lot of those um, projects already and some are currently underway I think it's also important that we, take, we constantly take a look at that plan uh, to make sure that it's revised when needed so that it's currently up to date with our community. Some important things of the plan though was that we were going to continue to be a welcoming and vibrant community, that we were going to respect the culture and history that we have, and so I think that's important to hold on to. We want to make sure that Kerrville remains a place that we love to call it home, that led us to stay here and for even some to move here to Kerrville. And so the 2050 plan is that should be the core of everything that we do in our community. It has been for many years and as mayor, I'll make sure to continue working on those core visions that our citizens put together. 2050 plan was devised and, and worked on by over 400 citizens. What they basically said is this is what we want Kerrville to be. It is important for city councils 
to work to achieve those goals. Um, in the past year, we've worked on several of those goals. One of those was uh, diversifying the income stream for the city of Kerrville. But also we've worked on uh, uh, improving the downtown area, which was one of the goals. We're uh, working on expanding the river trail, another of the goals. We are working to uh, attract uh, new businesses to diversify the tax base, like we've already said. And uh, I'm th trying to think, uh, oh, and working with uh, uh, organizations like Habitat for Humanity to expand workforce housing, which was another 2050 plan. I think this council has been working really hard to not only fulfill the 2050 plan, but to, uh, to make sure it's done in a responsible and sustainable way. Well, the 2050 plan, um, as I look through it, there are a lot of good things in the 2050 plan. Um, but I think we do occasionally need to look back at some of the assumptions that were made at the time the 2050 plan was implemented, make sure that those assumptions are proving true as far as population growth, um, jobs created, um, just our progress, and, and make sure that we're still on track. Um, in a practical sense though, the 2050 plan I've seen repeatedly when I go to city council meetings, it is selectively used. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. There was one development that was put before planning and zoning and then in turn was taken before the city council that in the 2050 plan, that particular parcel was recommended for low density housing um, or even parkland, open land. And that's what the 2050 plan called for. What was being considered was medium and high density housing on this piece of property. And yet, the proposal to city council included a recommendation saying that this was part of the 2050 plan. Well, for that particular parcel, it was not at all. So we need to be, we need to be very transparent with how we're using the 2050 plan. Are we only picking and choosing it at certain times or are we actually deviating from it while we claim to be addressing it? It's a good plan, but we need to revisit it and we need to make sure that we're sticking to it. Well, we're actively working on the 2050 plan every single day. It's like our Bible. Um, it's what the community is demanding from their council, is that we help them reach the goals that they outlined in their 2050 plan. Uh, that includes um, quality of life projects, it includes uh, attainable housing, it includes uh, water conservation. So we're actively working on those things every single day. and. I operate with a trust but verify philosophy and we've got a great team at the city. We talk every day um, and, and they are on top of every project that we're striving to complete in order to, to maintain the, the vision of that 2050 plan. Well, my goal is to accomplish the 2050 plan or to make sure that we incrementalize the 2050 plan. I've noticed sitting in council chambers, there's a lot of funding that goes on and kind of as they're going out the door with the dollar, they say, oh, and by the way, this is in keeping with the 2050 plan. Uh, I have a six month old granddaughter. In 2050, I'll be dead. In 2050, she'll be 27. She's gonna need a job. She's going to need a home she can afford, and she's going to need a community that's not morally or fiscally bankrupt. And so I'm very worried about the sustainability of Kerrville if we get too far out over our skis on the 2050 plan. All it takes is about a five to 10 year downturn in the economy where people don't come visit. We always have an attrition of the older seniors dying off or moving away to live with their kids or something of that nature. And then all of a sudden the real estate values start to go down. And then how are we going to keep maintaining this 2050 spending spree with the taxes that we can only collect from those people that are still remaining here? I'm old enough 
and been around enough to know that when you do some of those kind of forward planning, you do it in a very arithmetic and straight level, but nothing in life goes straight. And so there's gonna be times that, that things are better and there's gonna be times that things are worse. I'm just worried that if we don't watch it, we're gonna put ourselves in a position that when times get worse, uh, we're going to see a much greater depreciation in all of our core value, which is our real estate. Ever since I've been here, and I've been in real estate the whole time, you know, we've always appreciated about 6% a year, uh, and it's always outpaced inflation. Lately, we've had some real runaway things that I'm afraid some of that money is going to go back to money heaven. So right now we have an ongoing, uh, I think, agreement or some would call it a concern or an issue uh, with Headwaters Groundwater Conservation District. I don't see it as big of an issue as some may try to make it out, but I do think you know, water is life for our community. And one thing that we need to make sure that we're doing is in order for us to have a sustainable community, we need to conserve and work to see what other resources do we have in terms of water. A lot of this can come with a working conjunction with other water regulatory agencies and entities. Headwater is one, TCEQ is another. And so to make sure that we're constantly working together. As mayor, uh, you serve as an individual who facilitates negotiations and conversations and a lot of these key topics. Uh, and I have great relations with everybody at Headwaters, including individuals on the county commissioner's court. And so working with those individuals to make sure that we have water that can sustain our community is important. We also have to acknowledge that we are in a drought stage right now. Um, everywhere in Texas, this isn't unique to Kerrville. But as mayor of Kerrville, it's important that we take care of that, um, that issue now. We also need to make sure that we are really communicating with the citizens. Right now, a common concern that citizens are telling me is that they feel that they aren't getting the truth or all of the information that they need. Communication is number one with the city council and citizens to make sure that we continue on the right path for our community. I think our citizens are responsible enough and can handle the truth, uh, whether it's, as our city manager says, the good, the bad, or the ugly. So we need to put it all out there and work together because unless we don't, if we don't communicate, we're not gonna be able to have a sustaining community for much longer. And so working towards water is life for our community and working to make sure that we can continue to grow responsibly with our water resources is important. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about water that doesn't take into account Kerrville's unique water system. We actually have five sources of water. We have the river, flow of the water. We have a reservoir, which is the Nimix Lake. We have uh, ground wells, which is pumping water out of, the, out of the ground. We have the ASR wells, and there's like almost 900 million gallons stored in the ASR wells. That's over 300 days supply. And people don't realize, that, don't realize it because they can't see it. And lastly, we have a reuse pond. The reuse pond has 99 million gallons of water in it. This water is used to irrigate uh, playing fields and also uh, Shriner University uses it. Several golf courses use it. To say we don't have any water when we have a drought. What flies in the face of 30 years of this community working and investing in a water plan? We have water. We have a sound water plan. And because we have a diverse source of water, we have a good plan for the future. Just because the river starts to look scary doesn't mean we don't have plenty of water. I've been talking with city council members. I've been going to meetings. I've been going to headwaters. And the city has a unique way of looking at our water situation. Um, we are unique in that we have both groundwater and surface water that we can pull from. But they use the ASR wells, which are wells where during high times of precipitation and high river flow are our water, excess water is pumped back down into the aquifer, aquifer and supposedly stored there. But I use that term stored this way with the quotes because an aquifer is a slow moving river 
and there is no guarantee that that water will be there. In matter of fact, when we hit the drought stage last summer, the very fact that our aquifers were so low that headwaters had to step in and ask the city to make adjustments showed that the ASR wells cannot be relied on during heavy drought periods. There is no 800 million gallons of water stored down in our aquifer for use whenever we may choose to pull it out. It's just not there. And when the river flows are low, our water is filled with organics and that's an inescapable fact that's just going to happen. It requires excess treatment to get rid of the organics and then we often end up with safety violations of our water quality. So I have talked with city council about a lot of these issues and we're really having problems coming to agreement on how this can be taken care of. We are a model city for water conservation. We have four water sources. We've got surface water, we've got groundwater, we've got reclamation ponds, and um, we've got our ASR wells. And the, ge the geologists will tell you that our water plan is beyond a 50-year plan. Um, and that tells me how healthy our community is. I also want to say that um, you can go online and seek information about our current water situation and what kind of shape we're in. I know that from 2015 to 2017, we had 23 water violations. And in the last six years, from 2018 to 2024, We've only had five. And so what that tells me is that we are focused on our water. We're, uh, we're, we're talking to people about conservation and um, we're in a healthy position. Well, I, I will, as I told you, when I ran for mayor two years ago, water was one of my top two issues. And, and what I'm not really convinced with yet, I think we got adequate sources of water. I'm, I'm not saying that we don't. But we have to realize we're in the fight of our life and it's over water. There are people downstream from us. There's a big town called San Antonio down from us and there's a bunch of other towns south of us that want our water. And we consider it our water, but the way the laws of the state of Texas have, uh, have been written, we need to start to do more to capture water where we can legally make it our water. And, and some of that is going to be surface water. I've long been an advocate of increasing the size of the Nimitz uh, Dam and, 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 and the lake there, as well as creating other tributaries, because when you get right down to it, or retentions, get right down to it, that's a great source for revenue, fishermen, you know, people enjoying it, and, and all that. But the water's got to come from somewhere. And we're not going to be able to uh, sequester all water to the city of Kerrville. One of the things I think we have to start looking for is more of a regional look at water and sewer. For instance, every drop of our sewage goes to one of the highest points in town. And you put them through lift stations. And for those lift stations, we make bond issuance. And then we get them upgraded. We don't really use sinking funds to keep them maintained. And at some point, we have to start looking at water just not as Kerrville's commodity, but as Kerr County's commodity, while we protect the interest of those of us that are in the city that have been paying the freight to get the water supplies that we do have. We're doing okay, but I think there's a lot of areas that we can improve, and I'd be interested to participate in that. So right now, I think the city council and the mayor can work towards a better plan towards affordable housing. A uh, former mayor, I believe two mayors ago, uh, did put together a housing study with a committee, an ad hoc committee, and these individuals from our community came up with a plan. Unfortunately, the city council hasn't actually looked at that plan in over a few years together as a whole to make sure that we can come up with solutions that address those issues that were in the plan. Um, as an individual council member, I have reviewed that, and I think that needs to be at the forefront. You know, we talk about growth. We have to have the housing to house the people who are going to be able to move here. It's also important, you talk about jobs earlier, 
that we have the housing for everyday working individuals. Most recently, the City Council just awarded 30, about $30 million to Lennar Housing for what was supposed to be an affordable and attainable housing project. It's not going to turn out to be that way, unfortunately. Lennar is a multi-billionaire corporation for housing. They do not need Kerrville's taxpayer dollars in order to fund their project. What we should be doing is looking at our government regulations. We, as Kerrville, are one of the places in the entire state of Texas that I hear from a lot of develop developers and contractors. They do not want to come and build in Kerrville because it is so difficult. The City Council has a responsibility to make sure that our building regulations are less stringent while also keeping the citizens safe. A recent thing, this isn't just commercial developments, this goes to residential as well. Uh, a neighbor of mine had to spend in the sum of about $300 to $500 in addition to what she wanted to do to put up a carport at her house. She had to get a permit for that and a permit to be her own contractor. These are burdensome regulations that we should not be putting on our citizens and contractors. Well, I, was, I have voted several times to support plans for affordable housing. Uh, we did a deal with Lennar, which was controversial, and took a lot of planning from the City Council. In fact, the City Council negotiated very hard with Lennar and changed a lot of the parameters of that program. But that's going to yield, what, four or five hundred new homes for uh, affordable housing. We also worked with Habitat for Humanity. Habitat for Humanity is trying a hybrid development system. They're going to have well, they're going to have traditional habitat homes, but right next door they're going to have affordable homes built by private builders. That thinking out of the box really helps uh, provide homes for those who need them. But there's an even additional way we're working on affordable housing. If we increase the supply with Habitat and Lennar, and the demand remains constant or slightly elevated, that might mean that other homes and other neighborhoods won't go up in price so fast. It's a, simply a, a matter of supply and demand. We are adding to the supply while uh, hoping that the demand in other areas will slow a bit so that uh, property values won't go up so fast and families can afford that first home. Housing is a problem in Kerrville, but uh, one aspect that I see is of the problem is our taxes. Property taxes, where they are, drive up housing costs. It begins with just, not just with homeowners, but for people living in apartments um, and in rental homes. Landlords have to charge additional rents when property taxes go up. Um, currently, property taxes went up over 30% in the last two years. Those kinds of increases are driving up housing costs. And that, if that is not addressed, all the other ways we might address housing costs are going to be undermined. Um, I think affordable housing should start with affordable, reasonable apartments. Um, Entry-level housing is usually going to be apartments. That's for the first time person moving out of their parents' house or, or leaving college and getting their first place they live. Apartments are a much more reasonable expectation for affordable housing, and they're easier on our environment. So as you add apartments, then you, you reduce the um, demand by increasing the supply, and then you'll actually see a reduction in entry-level housing uh, based on that. So I think we need to head in a different direction. I think the Lennar development was a disaster. It isn't what the city wanted. It, um, the council voted for it and with much opposition from very experienced people. And I don't think it met the needs of affordable housing and it cost the city $30 million in future tax income. Well, it's, it's partnerships that matter because the need here in, in Kerrville is so great. The, the, the 2050 plan outlined something like 3,000 uh, housing units in the next 20 years. Well, 
you need big developers for that. And the only way to get developers here is to form partnerships with them. And um, uh, speaking of Lennar, there's a, um, there's a misconception out there that the taxpayers gave Lennar $30 million. And that's not what happened. What happened was Lennar invested the $30 million in infrastructure and we are helping them through a TERS. We are helping them to recoup some of that $30 million investment. And so it's those partnerships that are going to help us um, uh, resolve our housing issues. Also, um, right now the apartment complex uh, construction industry is uh, not affordable as well. So uh, we, we have to work together and um, uh, do what's best for the community as a whole when it comes to affordable housing. Well, that's interesting because I am very much a free market person. Um, I personally don't believe that the city has any reason to be in, in housing. Um, I believe that you're, the city is best used and providing the services that only a city can provide, you know, which is water, sewer, safety, courts, you know, that sort of thing. Public housing can be provided in, in any number of ways and by developers. And in fact, interestingly enough, there's many times I've lost on a project because the city gave land to somebody that was going to buy land from me. And so as a developer, you don't really like having to compete against your own city government. And just to be brutally honest, I don't think they're going to be any good at it. The other concern I have is this, is that if you go in for some of these uh, you know, private public partnerships and housing authorities and all this other kind of stuff, if you start to read the fine print, we very will likely lose control of that facility to some federal agency or some state agency in the event of X, Y, or Z. And I don't know that that's what we want. For me, Kerrville has always been the Goldilocks real estate market. We have a few people always dying off, not to be crass, but it's the reality of it. And then we have people coming in, and so we always just kind of climbed along and climbed along. And we got enough of the climbing along, well then here comes commercial jobs, and here comes commercial enterprise, and so on and so forth. Creating a housing authority, in my opinion, is something that we really, really, really have to look at very with a very jaundiced eye, I guess would be the best way to put it. Because I see it as a path to putting us into a position that I begin start to wonder what is the sustainability of the lifestyle that we all moved here for. I don't think any of us moved here for housing authorities and for projects, quote unquote. Well, it's been an honor to speak with you very briefly um, and provide a glimpse into the work that we can do together for Kerrville. Kerrville is a vibrant community and has been my home for almost my entire life. Um, we have such a rich culture, a wonderful history, and a small town charm that cannot be beat. We also have a wonderful community of people who are willing to come together for a common goal because this is our home. And we wanna make sure that we can continue to call it a place that attracted us to move or stay here. Together, we need to continue working to provide the essential services for our citizens who live here now, and to support a community atmosphere where individuals, families, and businesses have an opportunity to succeed. I have a solid record of doing just that for going on the third year of serving as your representative on the city council. Now, in any campaign, you may find some who will try to distract the voters from the real issues facing our community with scare tactics, lies, and even misinformation. I urge you to seek out the facts and rely on credible sources. And let's focus on what this campaign is really about, serving the community and the people of Kerrville and building a sustainable future. I love our community and I love the work that has come with serving as your representative on the city council. Some may do it for a title or for putting it on their resume. I do it because I truly love the work that comes with it. Our community deserves a public servant who is honest and transparent, listens to the citizens, works hard for them, 
exhibits respect and professionalism for everyone, not just those they believe they were elected by, and stands on principle. If you place your trust in me, I promise that I will continue to exhibit those qualities as your mayor. So I'm asking, humbly asking, for your vote on May 4th. Together, let's make a difference, let's make history, and let's work together so that we can continue to be proud to call Kerrville our home. I look forward to continue serving you and being your voice, your mayor. Thank you and God bless. Look, it's an important election. Elections are like a conversation and we've been having a conversation about the future of our community. I look forward to a Kerrville that grows sustainably. I look forward to a Kerrville where we treat each other with respect. I look forward to a Kerrville that reminds me of the Kerrville I grew up in. We want that small town charm even though we continue to grow. I'm very thankful to the Chamber of Commerce for allowing the, the candidates to speak. Look, I want you to vote for me. But if you don't vote for me, I still want you to go vote. It's important that we all make our voices heard. And no matter the result, it's been an honor not only serving on the City Council before, but being a candidate for mayor this time. Thank you. Once again, I want to thank you for listening. Uh, I want to thank you for giving time to hear all the candidates and their positions on the issues. I hope you'll consider me for City Council Place 4. I'm going to address issues head on. I'm not going to stick my head in the sand and pretend that hard things don't have to be decided. Pretend that they'll go away. I am very concerned about our water, our growth, our taxes and spending, I'm also concerned about preserving our freedoms. Texas is a fabulous state. Kerrville is one of the best cities in it. But if we lose Kerrville to progressive ideas that undermine the very things that made us the strong city that we are, then we risk losing Kerrville. And as we lose our small cities in Texas, we lose Texas itself. And if we lose Texas, we lose the nation. Our nation is under huge pressure right now. I think all of you feel it. We can begin making change right here locally. That's how, it that's how we'll save our country. And this election means a lot. I hope you'll go out and vote. I hope you will participate. And I hope you will consider me for place four on the city council. And thank you very much. This is our town and our future. I'm here to finish the job that we started together. As your current Place 4 council member, I am dedicated to continuing our mission and staying true to the vision outlined in the Kerrville 2050 plan. Beyond plans and promises, my vision is rooted in action. I am here to listen, to understand, and to act upon the voices of all voters. Your concerns, your hopes, and your dreams shape the path we walk together. Our community's safety is paramount. I will continue to put measures in place that not only uphold law and order, but also help to foster a sense of security for every resident. Together, we will work tirelessly to address issues head on collaborating with law enforcement, community leaders, and residents alike to create a safer environment for all. This isn't just about continue, continuing what we've started. It's about building upon it, strengthening our foundation, and ensuring that every step we take is in the best interests of our community's future. With your support and partnership, we will realize a brighter, safer, more prosperous tomorrow for Kerrville. Let's keep moving ahead together. Thank you. Again, I'm Brent Bates running for place three. And like I said, there's probably a lot of you that don't know me. Uh, even some of the you that might think you know me, having heard rumor, innuendo, or people that just uh, have a problem with me, you can probably tell from my answers, I don't have any problem telling you how I feel or how I think. I also have no problem being on the bad end of a vote. 
And if for some reason everyone else wants to vote in another direction, then we'll go in that direction. I'll do everything I can to help them in going in that direction. But I will be a strong advocate for those things that I understand and those things that I believe in. I have a very high white collar education. I started with Merrill Lynch when I was 24. I've been a CFP, or RIA, a, a COU, CHFC. I've hold a 7, 8, 63, 65 securities license broker since, real estate broker since 85. I've been life insurance agent. I've sat in offices uh, talking Dolph Briscoe into giving two and a half million dollars for a new cancer center and a cardiac wing, all the way down to his young man throwing papers at Ross Perot's house. So I've been around the horn and done a lot of things. A lot of people don't know a whole lot about me, even though I've been here 33 years, predominantly because I've gone to church in Fredericksburg. My dad was pastor of the Bible church in Fredericksburg. And then later he was pastor of Bible church in Marble Falls. And so uh, that, that, that makes you kind of the uh, victim of the local church rumor mill when you don't go to church here. And I'm okay with that as well. Also, doing the things that I do, I'm used to controversy. I'm used to having articles written disparagingly about me, and people say, well, what, did you, what do you think about that? And I just basically explain to them, I kind of believe in what Denzel Washington says. If you want to be misinformed, then listen to the media. Um, I'm not misinformed about myself because I don't read any of the local media. Um, but I am very interested and being able to maintain the lifestyle that I moved here for and that I love so much. You know, I'm part of the multi-generational citizens. We have transitory citizens that retire here and live here for five or 10 or 20 years or whatever it is. And those people vote, they vote a lot. Unfortunately, the multi-generational people here in town have kind of quit voting. And I think part of the reasons that they have kind of quit voting and we have a low voter turnout is that they kind of feel like that they always get outvoted by those transitional people. And I got news for you. We all want to maintain what we've got. I'm more interested in maintaining what we've got than creating a 2050 Nirvana or creating anything else. Do we have to grow? Everything has to grow or you're going to run out of money when it comes to the tax base. So I'm for growth. But let's do it slow and steady, and let's keep the great lifestyle we have here in Kerrville.